You are listening to Harmony Sermons at Harmony Church in Sumter, South Carolina. And we love the fact you decided to join in on listening to this sermon today. But we also realize that there is no substitute in connecting with others. If you have any questions about visiting church, or if we can connect you to a local church wherever you are, please visit us at HarmonyChurchSumter.com. Cheers, and let's begin. If you have a Bible this morning, let's go to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John 5. One of my uh, dad's prized possessions from his childhood was a Hopalong Cassidy hot chocolate mug. Now, if you don't know who Hopalong Cassidy was, he was this fictitious cowboy from the 1950s. He had a a television show that was geared toward kid. He was kind of like the the Walmart version of the Lone Ranger. Not quite as cool as the Lone Ranger, but, but he was still pretty cool. And when dad was little... Uh, he loved Hopalong Cassidy, and he was a part of the Hopalong Cassidy fan club. And uh, as a member of the fan club, he got a few things for being a part of that club, including this mug. And uh, when I was growing up, he'd keep the mug on his desk, and he'd put like pencils and pens and paper clips in it. Well, I must have been about 12 years old, and uh, I reached for something on the desk, and I accidentally bumped the mug and it fell off and it shattered onto the floor into about a hundred pieces. And I can remember feeling so awful about that. Like I broke my dad's like one and only thing that he kept from his childhood. Just shattered it. There was no way that we could super glue it back together. It was broken into too many pieces. And I remember that dad was gracious about it. He didn't make a big deal about it. But I always felt really awful about breaking this really valuable thing. Now, I I tell you that story to say that as Christians, we believe and understand that we have been given something incredible in the gospel, something that is so valuable and precious. It's, It's salvation, right? Jesus has saved us from our sin, and he's changed our eternity from hell to heaven. And I think the question that a lot of Christians wrestle with is this, is my salvation just another gift that I have the potential to break or lose? Like, can I mess up this incredibly valuable thing that God has given me? And the answer from the letter of 1 John that we've been studying is a resounding no. We're finishing up this uh, series through this book of the Bible today. We started off a couple of months ago in a series called uh, This We Know, The Power and Necessity of Christian Assurance. That's the first, uh, the, the point of the first part of this letter. Apostle John was concerned that his audience and us, that we know for sure that we're Christians. It's about assurance and, and confidence. But then John shifted gears a little bit. And he said, okay, now that you know that your faith is real and genuine, prove it. Like, show people that your faith in Jesus is real. And so today, as we finish up this series, John, he kind of goes back to that original idea of assurance. He finishes this letter by by making sure that we, uh, again, know that we're saved and that heaven is our destination. Because, man, it makes all the difference in the world going through life with spiritual confidence versus spiritual uncertainty. So where are you with with all this? Like on a scale of 1 to 10, how confident are you spiritually? Man, I hope that every person here this morning can say, 10 out of 10. I I know that I'm a Christian. I, I know that God is my Father. I know that heaven is my future. Okay, that's great. Is it changing you? Does that confidence have any bearing on on how you live your life? Is it making a difference right now? That's what this final chapter is about. And so the title of this sermon today is Confident Living for Troubled Times. Because we are living in troubled times. Uh, We are in uh, toward the end of a crazy political season. It's not going to get any better once the new president is elected, right? It, it's, going to, it's going to stay insane. And there are wars, and there's rumors of war, and there's been all this hurricane devastation. Not to mention just all the crazy stuff that happens in our lives every day. John is concerned that we have an anchor when life gets crazy. In the first ten verses of this chapter, John talks about some things that he's already talked about elsewhere in the letter. He's talked about the importance of, of the belief of Jesus as the Christ, and the love that should flow from that kind of faith. He talks about our obedience to God's command, being tied to the love that we have for God. But he gets to verse 11, and what he does is he offers us five truths about confident living. That's where we're going to spend our time this morning. So here's the first truth that John tells us. He says, if you're saved, you're safe. If you're saved, 
you're safe. Here's how John words it, verse 11. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Like, there, there's no gray area with John. He says, God has offered us eternal life. And the way that you get in on that eternal life is through Jesus. You either have Jesus or you don't. If you don't have Jesus, you're in dangerous territory. But if you do have Jesus, if you're saved, then you're safe. I mean, it's really as simple as that. And see, this is what makes the Christian faith so different and so unique from any other religion and, and philosophical system out there. All right? Because you can know where you stand with God, and it all hinges on what you do or don't do with Jesus. So how do you become a Christian? How, how do you get Jesus? Well, let me tell you, it is not through being a good person or, or doing good deeds. It's not through religious rituals like baptism and coming to church and reading the Bible. Even those, those things are, are wonderful and really important in your growth as a Christian. You don't become a Christian through your family heritage. My Mima was a, was a God-fearing woman, and I feel like that should count for me a little bit. No, it doesn't work that way. It's not through self-improvement. Man, I've, I've made some strides in my life. I've improved in some areas. It's not through comparing yourself to other people. Like, man, I'm, I'm not perfect, but I'm way better than she is. Now listen, you, you become a Christian. You get Jesus through repentance and faith. A couple of months ago, um, my wife, Steph, got a, a new iPhone. It wasn't the newest model. It was a couple of models old. But we, we bought it, we opened it up, and we realized that there was no charger in the box. Do you know that with new iPhone models, they, don't, they no longer sell a charger? So frustrating, annoying, so we had to go out and buy a charger. Why? Because as much as Apple has been able to innovate and as much technology as they can cram into this little thing that we hold in our hands that, that keeps us connected to the world, the one thing that Apple cannot give us is a phone that operates independently of a power source. And the great lie that so many people tend to believe today is that we can operate on our own, that we don't actually need God in our lives. And you might not for a while. But eventually, you are going to need God. And what I want to tell you is that Jesus is the power cord. He's the charger that connects us with God. Do you know Him? Like, Has there ever been a time where you have been confronted with the reality of your sin? And have you come to Jesus in repentance and confessed your sin and then placed your faith in what He did for you? That, that He took your sin upon Himself on that cross and He paid the penalty that you deserve. He paid that sin debt. Have you ever been saved? You know, I've said before, I I used to not like that word saved because it just sounds so like old school, right? Like, have you been saved, brother? But man, at the end of the day, there really isn't a better word to describe what it is that Jesus did for us. He really did save us. He rescued us. And if you're saved, you're safe. That means you cannot lose your salvation. Man, the last thing that I want for anybody at Harmony Church is to walk around unsure of their salvation. And yet so many Christians do. Because we look at our sin, and we look at our own weakness, and we look at how fragile our faith is, and we wonder, did it really work for me? Like, is this, is this salvation thing, is it a reality for me? You know, the late, great Tim Keller tells a, a fictitious story about the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea. You remember the context, right? Uh, they were slaves in Egypt, and, and, and God, through uh, Moses, spoke to Pharaoh and, and uh, tried to wake Pharaoh up to the reality that, that, that he needed to let these people go. And so Pharaoh finally agrees. He, he, he let him go, but then he changes his mind, and he and, and the Egyptian army come after the Israelites. And the Israelites are at the Red Sea, right? And God, again, through Moses, he allows Moses to miraculously part the Red Sea, and the Israelites crossed over on dry ground. And Tim Keller said, you have to imagine... That, that there were people that crossed over the Red Sea differently. Right? He's like, you, you got to imagine that there were people that crossed that, that are like, this is awesome. Like, wow, this is the most incredible thing I've ever seen. But he said, you, you, you got to believe that there were people that crossed the Red Sea like this. I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And, and yet they all landed safely on the other side. Why? Because their salvation was not based on the intensity or the strength of their faith but on the object of their faith. It is not how strong your faith is in Jesus that saves you. It's Jesus holding on to you that saves you. And if you're saved, you're safe. 
And so that takes us to the second truth that John offers us here. When you're safe, you can walk in confidence. Look at what he says, verse 13. He says, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. In the very next verse, verse 14, he talks about the confidence that will bring. This is the confidence we have before him. In other words, this confidence that we have in Jesus isn't something that's just meant to affect us in the next life. It's meant to make a difference in how we live right now. John is writing this letter so that you who believe in the Son of God can know for sure that you have eternal life. That word know occurs seven times in chapter 5. occurs 38 times in the entire letter. Like John hammers this over and over again because he wants us to walk through life with confidence. I think this is a really big deal to John because he knows that what we believe determines how we behave. I heard a story recently that illustrates this truth. It's a true story about a Japanese soldier in World War II. His name was Hiro Anoda. He was an intelligence officer in the Japanese army, and he was stationed on the island of Lubang in the Philippines during World War II. And when Japan surrendered in 1945, Anoda and a few other soldiers who were hiding in the jungle never received news that the war was over. So even as the war ended, Anoda continued to believe that it was still ongoing. Well, the Japanese government tried multiple times to inform him that, that he could come home. They, they dropped leaflets, they sent search parties, they uh, tried radio broadcast messages. Uh, Anoda dismissed all of it as enemy propaganda. For years, he lived in the jungle, surviving off the land, continued to engage in small gunfights here and there, thinking that he was still fighting for his country. He believed that as a soldier, he was duty-bound to follow his very last orders, which were to keep fighting at all costs. So officials in the Japanese government eventually realized that, that Anoda would only believe that the war was over if the news was personally delivered by the man who had been his commanding officer, who had retired after the war. So they located that commanding officer, they flew him to the Philippines where Anoda was hiding, somehow he found him and gave him orders to stand down. And this is a true story. On March 10th, 1974, Anoda laid down his rifle, left hiding, and returned to civilian life. This guy had held out for 28 years, six months and eight days, living in a self-imposed captivity, bound by a war that had long since ended. Because what he believed to be true determined how he behaved. And man, the same is true for us spiritually. John wants us to know that when you are safe spiritually, you can walk with confidence through life. So let me ask you, does that describe your life? Like, are, are you confident spiritually? Does the fact that Jesus has saved you and secured your eternity, does that make a difference in how you live your life right now? Think about how many different areas of life Christians don't have confidence in. Like, like maybe for you, you know intellectually that God has forgiven you of your sin, and yet it hasn't impacted your heart, and so you walk around in, in guilt and shame, and you constantly dwell on what you've done, and how you made a mess of this, and how you sinned there. Same thing with how a lot of Christians think about how God loves them. I, I mean, you know what the Bible says, right? You have John 3.16 memorized. You, you know that God loves you. But maybe you don't have much confidence that he really loves you. Maybe when you think about God's love, you think of a begrudging love. You think, well, God loves him and God loves her. And yeah, I think that God loves me, but it's probably only because he has to. If you think like that, it'll affect the way that you go through life. It'll mess with whether you really believe that God is with you or not. Man, are we tracking with anybody here? You can walk through life with confidence when you know that you are safe and secure with Jesus. And so that takes us to the third truth. When you walk in confidence, you can pray with power. When you are confident and sure about what you know to be true about God, and you know that you're safe and secure with Jesus, man, oh man, that'll change how you pray. You can start to pray with power. Here, here's how John talks about it, verse 14. He says, this is the confidence we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. This is the incredible thing about being a Christian, that you have the attention of the creative, creator of the universe through prayer. You know, we're told in Scripture time and time again that we can go to God in prayer with confidence the way that a little kid would go to a loving parent and ask for things. 
And look at the promise given here. He says, if we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. Which means, I am aligning my desires and my requests with God's purposes and character. And I'm seeking what he wants, not just my own preferences. And so the question is, how do we know what God's will is? Well, it helps when you know the Bible a little bit. The the more you know the Bible, the better we will understand God's will and character, which shapes how we pray. It also means that when I pray, I'm surrendering. I'm letting go of control. I'm letting go of the outcome that I might wish for. So praying according to God's will might look like this. God, I would really love this job promotion. But God, I'm going to trust for you to give me what's best, whether it's this opportunity or something else. I'm going to trust God's character and goodness and wisdom and love. I'm trusting and believing that he knows better than me. So let me ask you, does does praying with power, does that describe your prayer life? Are are you praying according to God's will? What kind of specific things will God say yes to in your life? Well, I don't know the specifics, but I do know this. God always says yes to need-based prayer. So God, I I am just struggling so much right now. I need your, your comfort. Would you please give me your comfort and your peace to go through this difficult trial that I'm in? God's like 100%. You got it. God, I really need some wisdom. I've got a big decision to make, and I am not sure what the right answer is. Would you please give me your wisdom? God's like, done deal. He will always say yes to need-based prayer. Now, one of the things that John tells us here about our prayer life is that we shouldn't just pray for ourselves, but for others, and specifically for those that are caught in sin. Look at how he words this, verse 16. He says, if anyone sees a fellow believer committing a sin that doesn't lead to death, He should ask, and God will give life to him. To those who commit sin that doesn't lead to death, there is a sin that leads to death. I am not saying he should pray about that. Now that's kind of a complicated verse, because John is talking here about two kinds of sin. One that leads to death, and one that doesn't. Most sins that we involve ourselves in don't cause like immediate spiritual death or separation from God forever. And so if you see a fellow Christian that's involved in a serious pattern of sin, John says we should pray for them and we should ask God to help get them back on track. God will forgive them and he'll give them life and he'll restore them to spiritual health. But John does mention another kind of sin that leads to spiritual death. This is something really serious, like just completely rejecting God and the work of Jesus. And John is saying here, for those who willfully and irrevocably reject God like this, spiritual death is their destiny. And we might be better off using our prayer time for something else. But the point is, there is power in prayer. Are you tapping into it? Are you utilizing it? What does the old hymn say? Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Back in December of uh, 2005, there was a man named Doug Heckman, and he was reading the end-user license agreement for a computer software program that he'd purchased, about as long and boring of a read as you can imagine. Apparently, this user license agreement had been reviewed and read by 3,000 people, but not one of them noticed what Doug had noticed, a line randomly inserted in the agreement that promised a reward for simply emailing the company. So Doug read that and thought, wonder what this is about. So he did. He emailed the company, and the company emailed him back, sent him back a check for $1,000. They wanted to see who was actually reading their agreement. And I read that story, and I thought, man, how much do Christians leave on the table because we just simply don't pray? Friend, what is it in your life right now that you need to pray about? Is it a sin issue that you just feel like you can't get over? Is it some kind of family or relational difficulty that's just making life complicated? Is it a health need? When you walk in confidence with the Lord, you can pray with power. And then fourthly, when you pray with power, you can experience victory over sin. John talks about this, verse 18. He says, We know that everyone who has been born of God does not sin, but the one who was born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. Now, what does John obviously not mean here? Well, he obviously doesn't mean that for Christians, you're you're never going to sin again. 
Uh, We've been born again. We've been given this new spiritual nature, but we aren't perfect. We still sin. We still mess up. That's why earlier in this, uh, in this letter, John encouraged us by saying, hey, when you do sin, we have this mediator in Jesus Christ that goes before us and God. It's a, it's a wonderful truth for, for Christians that still sin. So John doesn't mean to say here that we're not ever going to sin again. What he's talking about here is an ongoing pattern and lifestyle of unrepentant sin, and it just doesn't bother the Christian. Like that should not be the case for a believer in Jesus. But see, when you are connected to God through powerful prayer and you're abiding in Him, you will start to see victory over sin. That's the whole point of the second half of of this letter. We are to be living proof that God has made us new. For the Christian, the promise that your salvation is secure is not and should not ever be a license to sin and think that you're just going to get away with it. No, the fruit or the evidence that you belong to Jesus is that you actually start to look like He does. John goes on to say this in verse 19. He says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know the true one. We are in the true one, that is, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Friends, are you utilizing the resources that God has given you to defeat sin? Things like the Bible, and prayer, and your church family, and Christian friends that can encourage you and hold you accountable? Are are you sensitive to the Holy Spirit's conviction in your life when you do sin? A couple months ago, I was was at the gym one day, and I was working out, and I was in this one section of the gym, and I had my headphones in, and I had my phone, and I went over and I put my phone down in a little corner section that was kind of out of the way. That's what people do in the gym when they don't want to keep their phone in their pocket while they're lifting. So it's not uncommon at all to see people's phones on the ground out of the way. And so I finished up the set that I was on. I went over to grab my phone, and it was gone. And I just had this like instant panic and dread, like somebody stole my phone. And so I'm starting to look around. I'm scanning the gym, looking for anybody that might have, have it that, that was close by. And, and I, I knew that it had to have been close by because I could still hear the music in my headphones. So I'm looking around, and I I can't see anybody. And all of a sudden, as I'm walking around the gym, the music in my headphones stopped. And so I started to sprint toward the front door, heading toward the parking lot. I I figured they're probably in the car. They got my phone. They're they're taking off. If I see a car pulling out of the parking lot, I'm pulling like a Bo and Luke Duke. I'm jumping on the hood of that car. And as I ran by the front desk, there was a lady turning in my phone to one of the employees. So I got it back. No harm, no foul. She was trying to be helpful, but apparently didn't understand gym etiquette. You see a phone on the ground, off of the corner, just leave it alone. But the thing that alarmed me, the thing that made me know that I had to take action, was when the music in my headphone stopped. Now here's the point in your life. You can know that your sin has become a very big problem when you no longer hear the Holy Spirit's voice of conviction in your head. That when you sin and you no longer feel that urging of the Holy Spirit, you no longer feel that like uncomfortable little thing in your conscience, that's when you know I'm on dangerous ground. So friends, let me ask you today, do you have any confessing that you need to do? Do you have any sin in your life right now that the best thing that you could do is just come to God and turn from it and confess it to Him? In the book of Acts, it says that we should confess and repent of our sins so that times of refreshing may come. The way to get victory over sin is by confessing your sin to death. And so finally, the fifth truth about confident living is this. When you experience victory over sin, God's substitutes become unattractive. Notice how John ends this chapter in this entire letter in verse 21. He says, little children, guard yourselves from idols. Now, that's a really weird way to end the letter, right? Like, John, you're going to introduce this brand new topic to us right at the end of the letter with a little throwaway verse and then not not flesh it out? Well, remember that John is quite elderly at the time that he wrote this. And so when he calls us little children, he doesn't mean that literally. He's an older man talking to a, a predominantly much younger crowd. And what he says here in verse 21 is actually a very short summary of what John has been saying all along. 
John has gotten done reminding us over and over and over that the king of the universe has, has adopted us and he's brought us into the riches of his grace. And he's promised that there's nothing that can take away what is most true about us. We are safe. And so with all of that in mind, his final plea is this. If all of that is true, stop going back to dry wells. Stop going back to, to your old way of life. Stop chasing life in places where you know it cannot deliver the life that you're looking for and the life that you've already encountered in Jesus. Like, stop chasing it. These are what we call idols. See, an idol is not something that some remote tribe in the Amazon worships, right? Things of, of stone and, and wood carvings. No, all of us are prone to worship idols. Because this is what an idol is. It's when you love something and value something that isn't God way too much. An idol doesn't even have to be a bad thing. It is a, it is a good thing that has become a God thing. And so one a good way to know what your idols are in your life is to ask yourself some questions. Questions like this. What do I love most in life? What do I fantasize about? When I'm just kind of laying around and I'm vegging out, where does my mind start to wander? What am I terrified of losing? What is that one thing in my life that if I can't have it, it would make life not worth living? That, that's a good reflection of what your idols are, of what those things in your life are that are more important to you than God. But see, when I've been connected to Jesus... And I've been rejecting sin, and I've been experiencing what life is like when Jesus and, and, and I are close, then that helps me to keep the other things in my life, even the good things, in their rightful place. It helps me to see that while those things are good and enjoyable, they can't fulfill me like Jesus does. So again, let me ask you, what are the idols in your life? What is that thing right now that is in the place in your life where only God should be? And keep yourself from those God substitutes. Stay so close and so connected to Jesus that those God substitutes don't look attractive. Well, all those years ago, I stood over that broken Hopalong Cassidy mug that was shattered on the floor just feeling awful about it because I broke this incredibly valuable thing to my dad. But, you know, a few years later, I heard about a website called eBay. This online auction website where you can uh, sell and bid on all kinds of stuff that people are selling. And so I had a thought one day. Man, I wonder if I could find that Hopalong Cassidy mug on eBay. And so I got on eBay, and sure enough, there it was. Someone was selling it. Perfect, pristine condition. And so I put a bid on it. And lo and behold, my bid got accepted. And one Christmas morning about 10 years ago, I handed my dad a little uh, gift box that looked like this, and he opened it up, and his eyes got real big, because in the inside was a perfect Hopalong Cassidy hot chocolate mug in pristine condition. Friends, the point is this. Your faith might feel like it is fractured and broken, but the point is this. You have this assurance in your salvation that that salvation, that that faith in Jesus can never be shattered or lost or broken or taken away from us. So let's live with that kind of confidence this week. God, we uh, come to you now and we are, we are grateful, Father, that, that the security of our faith in you it hinges on you. Because God, every one of us here this morning goes through times where our faith is fragile and, and we can't feel you, we can't sense you in our life. God, those are the times where we are so grateful and thankful for this gospel truth that you are still holding on to us. We've sung about that this morning. And so, Father, I, I pray for uh, my brothers and sisters that are here this morning. Maybe, maybe somebody here, Lord, this morning is, is wondering if, if, you're, <laughs> if you're with them. Lord, I just pray through your Holy Spirit that you would instill confidence in them. Lord, this is, a, this is a crazy time to be alive, and there's so much chaos happening in the world and in our country and in our lives. And Lord, I pray that we would implement these truths that you have preserved for us in your word, that we can walk through life living confidently. And it's through the gospel. It's through your son, Jesus. God, we love you. We're grateful for you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.